if I injure you, the injury persists even after I actually commit the act. If I stab you, you may suffer complications long after that initial actual stabbing. That's the case with African Americans. There are people well within the living memory of this country that are still suffering from the after effects of that. What do we want? Reparations! What do we want now? Reparations are meant to redress or compensate for a really egregious injustice. It can be compensation in terms of money. There also needs to be a moral reckoning. The historical injustice has never been addressed. Ending an injustice is not the same thing as making up for its enduring effect. We need to have that controversial conversation ongoing so that we can begin to do something about it. Repair is happening because we said yes. A world shocked beyond belief sees the barbaric work of the dying Nazi beast. I'm originally from Germany and I grew up there. The Holocaust was discussed in every single school subject and I felt horrible about my history and um, ashamed of it. And here at Kaunitz, the ragged, piteous handful who survived. But then one day I met Mietzu Langer, um, a survivor of five concentration camps and a death march in his youth. After he passed away, I learned from his widow that he had received a reparations pension since the 1970s, first from the West German government, then from the government of reunited Germany. It was a small pension. It measured no way up to the losses he had as a young son. There is no money amount that could possibly represent those losses. When I came to the United States, I was drawn to that topic of reparations from my experience with Miechu. The procedure that I used to estimate reparations, I took census information about the enslaved population in each year from 1776 to 1860. I'm adding up all the hours, multiplying it with the wages customary at the time, and then adding a conservative 3% interest. I arrive at a outstanding debt of $20.3 trillion in 2021 dollars. We can see by the polls that support for reparations is over 70% among black Americans. A small but growing number of white Americans also believe that reparations are due to African Americans. And I think that's an important distinction. It's not a handout. It's a debt. The advocates for reparations explain in a heartbreaking way, you know, the systemic ways in which blacks and black families have been prevented and held back from building up the kind of generational wealth that many white Americans can expect. I think reparations ask us to imagine what America could be like without that kind of discrimination as we begin to repair the legacy of that discrimination. Like, what could America look like? As an elected alderman here, I serve my most immediate neighborhood, which is the Fifth Ward, the historically black community in Evanston. We are a small city, we're just north of Chicago, aesthetically beautiful, mature trees, you know, the home of Northwestern University, majority white and majority affluent. The black community right now is less than 17%. We had been in the mid 20% before um, as, as early as 2010. So there have been an exodus in the black community. I saw that there were historic and intentional systemic barriers between Black Evanston enjoying the same livability as the rest of Evanston. And we were going along, still celebrating our diversity and inclusion and, and that being a brand, but still carrying year after year uh, the racial separation, uh, household income gap, the wealth gap, the education gap, and so on. I 
didn't have the thought to localize reparations until uh, February of 2019. And it was in that moment that I immediately sent out the initial email to make the recommendation to the Equity Empowerment Commission to begin the road to repair in the city of Evanston. The local governments also have their own specific egregious acts against the black community that are verifiable and documented and have um, measurable harms. So in my role as a local elected, I thought that I might lead locally. You know, the front line is where your feet are. The first real grassroots movement for reparations, that was led by a woman named Callie House. It was in the 1890s and it was almost a two decade long struggle for her. And she made a claim uh, to the federal government for pensions. She used the mail to, to communicate uh, with Washington and then also to encourage people to join the movement. You know, at one point she had almost 300,000 people had signed up, were paying dues, and the government in response accused her of using the mail for fraud. She was actually convicted by an all-white jury and spent a year in prison. Reparations for slavery have been paid repeatedly in history, but to the wrong side, to the slave owners rather than the enslaved. The French government sent a fleet to Haiti to demand reparations for the abolition of slavery there. Similarly, the British government paid reparations to the enslavers in, in Great Britain. In the United States, two reparations were paid to slave owners in Washington, D.C when slavery was abolished there in 1863. The recipients were white. It was considered normal. And it's interesting that the, the program becomes controversial when the recipients are black. Staff recommend City Council adoption of Resolution 126-R19, establishing the City of Evanston Reparation Fund and creating a revenue source for the fund. So in 2019, we passed Resolution 126-R19, which restricted the first $10 million of cannabis sales tax to fund reparations programming. We selected that as a city as our funding mechanism because 71% of the marijuana arrests were in the black community. And if you remember, I said we're only less than 17% of the population. So certainly over-policing is an issue and was an issue in fact then. So what more appropriate way than to use that tax revenue for repair? Eligibility is black residents that lived here between 1919 and 1969 and their direct descendants. And they will receive, if selected, a $25,000 direct benefit that can be used for housing uh, to build wealth. They can use it to purchase a home. It can be used to make any type of home improvements, but it has to be used to build wealth through home equity. Evanston passed this program, and now it is the first city in America to begin a program of reparations. That is a pretty momentous occasion. It's gotten a lot of attention, and you know it is showing a way that a city can repair harm done to its citizens. Now, the program initially, this $400,000 um, that will be given out in grants of up to $25,000, will go to probably about 16 families. I think the city council is aware that it's a small, modest program, and it's a first step. I am confident that my four parents and the many elders who raised me and paved the way for me are rejoicing because this is a move forward for the nation and the world. Reparations, when you hear the term, and as someone who's lived 18 generations in one parish and a southern state, this is not reparations. A vote in support of reparations program is a sign that my family is welcome here. It is a sign that Evanston cares about families that look like mine. It is an act of equity. When one is building a house, one does not build a kitchen and then say we will add other rooms as we figure out what kind of home we're going to build. It's just bad public policy and it blatantly leaves an impression 
that black people are not entitled to the same levels of concern and care as other city programs and projects. Reparations is a sensitive, you know, very controversial topic that gets at trauma that the black community has suffered. And a grant of $25,000 doesn't, to many people, seem to even begin to really repair that harm or acknowledge the damage. There is concern that, you know, calling this reparations takes away from this very big idea that the U.S. federal government needs to be responsible for a very big program that would benefit all eligible Black Americans. I had a colleague, when I first began to discuss this in 2019, recommend, let's call it anything other than reparations, just to avoid the controversy. That made it very clear we needed to call it what it is. But everyone in this process is going to be uncomfortable. The black community, we are renaming our injury and that's uncomfortable. The white community, they're dealing with their legacy of racism. You know, if our ancestors were enslaved, you know, their ancestors were enslavers. And so those are uncomfortable conversations that we're having together as a community. And it's really been a very productive uh, experience over the last couple of years. I've been appointed to serve on the Reparations Committee. So I will be looking at how do we increase this initial 10 million to, you know, 100 million in the next few years. And how do we expand the work from a 10-year goal to in perpetuity? Because it'll take that long for us to get to bridging our racial divide in Evanston. I've been also appointed to the National African American Reparations Commission. And I will serve along my colleagues there supporting other localities and lending my voice and advocacy to advance HR 40 as well. H.R. 40 is a resolution to study reparations, to look at what they might mean in America, what they might cost, how they might be structured. Um, it's a way to answer some of the important and also sort of logistical questions about reparations. Who would be eligible? You know, what would a program look like? And how would we pay for it? Reparations means making up for things that happened in the past. We should study reparations and make a judgment what they should be, what they should do. There are certain things we already know, and I support that study. Let's see where it takes us. We have a president who has said he supports the study of reparations. The country has been awakened and punched in the face with our racism that we experience far too often through social streaming and other ways of public lynchings of black people. We are entering an era of repair. The Roman Catholic Church just uh, made a commitment to $100 million for reparations. There have been universities that have done the same. Corporations are beginning to set aside dollars, specifically not just for all marginalized communities, but the black community. Localities are doing the same in advancing reparations. In Germany, 20 years after the reparations program, the young generations asked the older generations, where were you? What did you do? What happened in our city, in our town? We have a situation where we have street names, um, memorials, and military bases still named for southern generals, for the traitors in this country, but not enough for the people that actually helped abolish slavery and that uh, put us on the right track of history. So I think there's a lot that education can do, and a bottom-up process would be fantastic. We're all learning and growing together. We all aspire to repair the community, and we're learning from our history, but we have to take a first step. And we've taken our first step in Evanston.